find something new to educate us about. So here she is, Thank Dr. You, Sharon Barnes. Thank you. Happy to be here. It is also one of my favorite days of the year. Oh, great. Thanks. Okay. I might be able to handle that. Um, I'm always happy to celebrate the right to think, learn, and read. Um, I'm going to talk about the Florida so-called Don't Say Gay Bill, um, which you may have heard of. And um, But I'm going to talk about it in the context of a pretty alarming um, nationwide set of similar bills that are really happening all over the country. Some of them passed and turned into law already. So I should say the Don't Say Gay Law. Um, I would encourage you to stay tuned to this um, conversation that's happening at the national level. And of course, vote, 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 vote. That's the minimum. Um, thanks to the Van Books folks, Paula, Moji, and Arjun for my negligent uh, PowerPoint slide. Always great to be here with you. When I was reading up on this topic, it became much, uh, much more complex than I realized. And I have to say, in the 22 years that I've been doing this talk, this is the scariest moment I've ever seen in terms of censorship. And in fact, one of the things that I have regularly remarked on in my talk is that the Harry Potter books, which were, were challenged because they were a cult promoting, <laughs> and all the uh, I Am Jazz, the transgender girl uh, kids book, uh, I, I almost found myself mocking the um, protest because it always solicited an outpouring of support for the book, for the school, for the author, public readings of the book, people buying copies of the book for libraries. And I was like, it, it always backfires. You, you, you all should learn the lesson, you know? But in this case, the, the censorship uh, going into law is changing the way I feel about the current moment. Um, in, I mean, uh, the Dobbs decision has been a factor in my feelings about the current moment as well, January 6th, lots of things, but it seems like we're in a different uh, moment in terms of censorship, and some of my research um, bore that out. Um, I want to also, before I get into that, um, mention Dr. Barbara Mann, who I know spoke earlier uh, today, uh, Don't Say Genocide, interestingly connected to my title. Uh, I want to thank her for constantly inspiring me and educating me, but also giving me permission to use this slide, uh, which I use as a way to acknowledge the indigenous people whose land we're on right now. And to remind ourselves, as you know, UT is also doing this land acknowledgement, acknowledging the peoples who, whose ancestral homelands we're on. And you can see there's a fairly sizable list of them. Um, and we are now, as stewards of public lands, trying to do our best to get ourselves out of a, a worldwide climate crisis uh, caused largely by us. But what I want to say, in addition to the to traditional statement, is what Barbara makes uh, has made me aware of is that we have more of a responsibility than just to know that this is Wyandotte, Shawnee, Kickapoo, we are people's land but also that we have to learn something about their history. So I offer these two uh, resources, two of her many books, um, Land of the Three Miamis uh, and Native Americans, Archaeologists in the Mouths. These are books about Ohio. And so particularly interesting and useful if you want to educate yourselves. And Ohio means beautiful river in Seneca language, just FYI. Uh, but I think knowing those people's names is only the beginning of the process of becoming stewards. So I don't want to spend too much time, but I wanted to maybe spend a little more time in just flashing an acknowledgement. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge my home team there, the Women's Studies Department, several of them are here, and the group of people that constantly inspire me to learn the OXO. Uh, uh, really quickly, for those of you who maybe haven't been here all day, uh, is a little bit about the concept of banned books. And those of you who've heard me talk, this is kind of our becoming a standard part of my talk. Um, because I think banned books can be misleading. Um, when we think of banned books, we typically think of that, you know, burning or uh, you can't find this book, you don't have access to it, and you can't read it. And banning books is actually more localized and more specific than that. Um, and so the American Library Association that you've heard mentioned, if you were here for the um, Jeopardy 
uh, they make up this list of banned books. And what that means is uh, somebody has issued a written formal complaint about a book. And there's been a response of limiting access to that book. That is what they mean when they say banned. But that could be in a specific classroom. It could be in a school district. It could probably be statewide and not beyond that. Um, and typically, it's in one library, one school. So in that sense, it's a little bit better news because it's not banned everywhere. It's banned locally. It's still not good news. But uh, a challenge is an attempt to ban a book that is unsuccessful. And that happens quite frequently. And they also keep track of that. So you have uh, attempts to censor, censor books, and then you have successful restrictions. And sometimes it just means you need parents' support or permission, something like that. So even when a book is restricted in access, it doesn't mean it's set a um, However, recently there have been some book burnings in the United States, so <laughs> we are not, I'm not laughing. It's not fun. Um, but censorship does, of course, change access, and that is a serious concern. Um, I mentioned last year that I was uh, talking about In the Dream House, a book about an abusive lesbian relationship, um, that I could not get a copy of the book. It was missing at two of our public libraries and then checked out of the other two all summer long. And finally, I got it through here, UT, if you're in a library at home. But like, missing happens in a lot of ways. Censorship happens in a lot of ways. And so this is another point that I like to mention, that librarians may decide not to purchase a book, or a book may just become missing uh, because librarians or principals or other folks don't want to deal with the fallout of having that book and uh, listening to the criticisms or um, challenges that might happen. Uh, the how many uh, depends year to year, but uh, more than 5,000 over the last uh, decade. And then, um, 377 in 2019, 348 in 2018, and only 156 in 2000. This year, or 2001, uh, 21, 729. A radical increase in the number of challenges. Uh, five of the top 10 were directly mentioning LGBTQ people issues or content. Um, or sometimes they're just called sexually explicit. But if you look at that list, almost always when it's labeled sexually explicit, it's LGBT sex that is the sexually explicit uh, content. I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, PEN America, who I'm going to reference a lot today, a, a group that um, is interested in freedom of expression, writers, writers uh, said that from July to June 2022, uh, 2,532 individual book families were reported to them, so they're another group that's monitored. Um, 1,648 titles, uh, 1,261 authors, 290 illustrators, 80 translators. 41% of those books had LGBTQ content, so a lot of censorship of LGBTQ content. 40% um, of the bands that came to them, they estimate, were attributed to the to the um, legal bills that I'm also talking about today. So they're re connecting those um, heightened challenges to books to the laws that are being proposed and passed around the country. Um, I'll, briefly, what is challenged overwhelmingly is books, 82% this year. 5% um, programs and meetings um, for a couple of years. Drag queen story hours were very popular around the country, and those were being challenged. Um, databases, games, artwork, um, social media, and music. But by far, the biggest percentage is books. Um, who does the challenging? Not surprisingly, year after year, it's parents who do the largest amount of challenging. This year, 39%. Uh, um, Patrons, people who visit the library, 24%. Um, a new group this year that wasn't on, well, they're linking it to religious groups, has always been on this, but now it's political religious groups, and that's 10% of the challengers, uh, up from um, six, so increasing. Um, I will say that in recent years, I've heard, as I've been doing work, as I normally do research on children's books for this event, 
um, that organizations like Focus on the Family are typically often behind campaigns to challenge books around the country. And that's in fact true of these laws as well, that there are actually organizations like the Heritage Foundation, big conservative organizations who are writing model bills for people, for states, that senators and, and Congress people, that, that they are then adopting. And you'll see that in some of the language that I'll share. So I think um, political and religious groups uh, make sense in light of the current moment uh, that includes these laws that we're seeing. Uh, where 44% school libraries, that's up from 23% last year. And I think, again, reflecting the political influence on education. 37% public libraries, that's down from 59%, but I'm imagining that's because of the increase in challenges to public schools. 18% uh, individual classrooms, 3% academic libraries, and one in other libraries like prison libraries. Um, why? Any possible reason you can imagine a book can be challenged. Um, what you would expect, sexually explicit, uh, uh, inappropriate for age group, things like that, uh, vulgarity, profanity. Uh, you may be more surprised to hear things books being challenged because they're anti-police, for example, or, or it's religious viewpoint. And again, Harry Potter is talking that way. It's also targeted because Dumbledore was gay, even though we didn't find out Dumbledore was gay until 100 years after the books were all out. Um, I read two years ago that eight of the top 10 challenge books were removed for LGBTQ content. But last, interestingly, and I'm getting my little thesis about the current moment, last year by far the most challenges were for books that directly addressed racism. And this, I think, is the fallout from the murder of George Floyd and the potential possible um, cultural reckoning with racism that seemed to be happening uh, in the wake of that murder. Um, so when you consider the challenges going on to critical race theory, for example, um, this makes some scary sense that, that we see that. Um, some works are also challenged on more than one basis. Um, and the ALA makes a real point to say it's not always challenged, books are not always challenged uh, from the conservative right, that books are also challenged from the, from the left uh, for being sexist or homophobic or things like that. So books, anybody can challenge, can, can and will challenge a book. Um, so that's important to know, I think. Um, and before I move on to talk about Florida, I just want to sort of emphasize it's, this isn't a definitive list, and these numbers are probably grossly underrepresented. The ALA would say 85% uh, of uh, people who censor books don't report. The, the librarian doesn't report, or the principal, they just do the censoring. And so then if you factor in how many librarians or teachers might just decide not to teach a controversial topic to avoid the whole, I don't want to be on social media getting myself attacked, I'll just pick something safe. Uh, so that's a different kind of censorship. Lucky for us, librarians are quite courageous, and teachers also are very courageous who and regularly do things that uh, would be dangerous to them. Um, but you can imagine how many times that happens. Um, so Florida's don't say gay law. Um, I'd be really pleased if you didn't recognize Ron DeSantis there, um, who signed in March uh, of 2022, the Parental Rights in Education Bill that we, uh, that uh, folks who are concerned about the censorship would call the Don't Say Gay Bill. Um, and I would say, you know, as a teacher, note how framing, how we, how the naming of this bill uh, helps us identify what, what to think about the bill. So if you hear Don't Say Gay Bill, oh my God, that sounds crazy. But if you hear Parental Rights in Education, well, yeah, have a right, you know, so, so it, it's like the pro-choice, anti-choice, pro-life, anti-life, right? The, the framing of the debate really helps, well, I shouldn't say helps us understand, guides us, leads us, or coerces us into understanding. Um, the bill itself bans instruction or, and that's a big word for a two-letter word, classroom discussion about LGBT issues for K through three. Interestingly, sex education is prohibited in many states up until fifth grade anyway, so there would be no reason maybe to do that. 
Um, critics say it tries to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Um, it limits discussions, though, and it could stifle conversation for children who need to work through some of these, and certainly would affect uh, children whose families would not be represented in the materials uh, or things like that. And certainly, this I'll say more about chilling effect, but that's already happened. It also empowers parents to sue the school district over teachings they don't like, and the district has to pay for it. So schools are preemptively shutting down their um, teaching or conversation about topics, especially LGBT issues. Um, librarians across the country are accusing their schools of preemptively removing materials so as not to be sued. Again, they're cash at school districts, they're law of uh, suit averse principles. You can see it happening. The third thing it does is that it requires schools to tell parents when their child receives mental health services which you might think, oh. uh, but uh, schools sometimes are a haven for gender non-conforming, non-binary, queer, ident trans-identified students who are not safe in their own homes. And so a student who talks to a counselor about a gender questions, uh, is the, the, per, the counselor is supposedly going to be forced to notify the parents about this, which of course is incredibly dangerous to the child uh, and certainly puts the counselor in a completely ethically compromised situation. Um, so for all those reasons, the, the bill has been very controversial uh, and it certainly paints LGBT people as other and pretends that we are not teaching gender every day in every book that represents gender, uh, in, 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 which to me makes me so frustrated. Um, and it, so dangerous at this moment of political polarization, uh, and as more young people than ever are coming out as queer in some way, gender queer or sexuality queer. Uh, so, you know, DeSantis, if you don't know, DeSantis has presidential aspirations, and so part of this is it's all good publicity to him because it shows him as a tough, you know, person, tough for, you know, whatever you think those values stand for. Uh, he said uh, uh, that people who call it the Don't Say Gay Bill are misrepresenting it. They have to lie. Because if they admitted what they were really for, it would be sexualizing kindergartners. And that's what he thinks this is really about. Uh, he gave this is on an interview with Fox News. His press secretary accused opponents of the bill of grooming children, like you know, grooming children to be gay or, uh, or whatever. Uh, and here again, framing the bill in support of parental rights. Push, pushes us to ask the question, which parents? It, it presumes a cisgender heterosexual family. Uh, and, and again, I, I, I want to emphasize that lots of these books are also targeted for racial components. So again, it also kind of promotes a, this whitewashing of who would care about their kids' education. So um, critics point out that it, it bans instruction. But the preamble also mentions discussion. So there's also this kind of ambiguity, like I can't even talk about it. Uh, not to offer instruction, but just to mention that it exists. Um, and I, I, I want to note too that censor, censorship, like the removal of books, um, respond, people respond with protests. So I, I wanted to just put that other photo out here to say people are not just accepting this lying down, and I told the story at the beginning about how it feels like it backfires on them so often. But in this case, it really didn't backfire. This has become law. This is law in, in Florida. And if you're paying attention, um, you know that more than 54 separate bills in 24 states are, are have been introduced in the last year with similar kinds of language and intent. Um, most of them target either LGBT identity or any instruction about race, racism, etc. Those, those are the topics, and I want to say a little bit more about that. Um, prohibited ideas, uh, the Ohio language is divisive content. Uh, uh, when Hamer did a presentation earlier today about our, the bill in Ohio, 
Um, but basically, it prevents us from teaching accurate history, accurate biology, accurate sociology, accurate social science. Um, and again, under the guise of parental protection, often these bills are say, we, we believe in the freedom of speech. It is important for people not to feel racially targeted. Meanwhile, what the bill actually says is we don't white, want white people to feel guilty about whiteness. We don't want people to be taught that the United States is essentially racist or was founded on racist precepts. If you study your actual history, you know very well the history of racism in this country. Um, so this is why Pan America calls these educational gag orders, because they really are um, much more um, specifically targeted certain kinds of education than their lofty language about freedom of speech or parental rights would make that seem. Um, and so am I over time? Because I'm not, I wasn't. It's 3.07. OK, because I started late, too, so yeah. If you are. Okay. <laughs> was, I thought I was at 2.30, and I know it was after 2.30. So I just wanted to say a little bit about background. Um, and uh, what, it, what, what is, was amazing to me, again, when I was doing my homework for this, I had no idea about the uh, coordinated effort that was happening here. Um, but basically, an agenda to mobilize the political base uh, to, to target diversity as un-American. Um, and teaching diversity or diversity agendas. So uh, critical race theory has been attacked everywhere on this grounds, which is basically a theory attempting to understand why we haven't made progress since the civil rights movement in lots of areas and coming up with theories about why that structural racism is, is perhaps is a real thing. Um, and if you remember, um, and gender studies as well, and you know, if you remember Hillary Clinton being called a pedophile, right? Because she ran a pedophile ring in a basement of a pizza parlor in, in, in Washington. And I think the questioning of um, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, if you remember, they made such a big issue about her sentencing for um, a pornographer. In one child pornography case, again, trying to portray her as some kind of supporter of pornography. Like this is to link LGBT issues with race diversity issues with other kind of diversity issues is an intentional uh, in the 1619 project from the New York Times award-winning historical look at racism in the United States specifically mentioned in some laws that they cannot teach that that actual thing which is if it isn't censorship I don't know what censorship is um, uh, president then president Trump, Trump called it Toxic propaganda, the ideological poison that will dissolve the civic bonds that tie us together, it will destroy our country. Before he left office, he signed an executive order that literally the name is Combating Race and Sex Stereotyping. And it is a blueprint for canceling diversity training, prohibiting diversity training, and threatening to withdraw money federal funds from institutions that persist in doing diversity trainings, including probably every single university in the public university in the country. Um, some universities immediately canceled all their diversity trainings. Um, so worried were they about, I mean, everybody is cash strapped. So this is this was not uh, uh, insignificant. And in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and the potential awakening um, especially for white America, around the persistence of racism, this is an absolute backlash against the movement forward on those issues. Um, the racial replacement theory that we're hearing talk about now is, is a part of this backlash as well. Uh, Pan America links this to a scholar, Chris Lupo, who appeared on um, a, a Fox News show that Trump watched and then followed up with in, in banning diversity trainings in the federal government, which he did first. Um, so uh, Rupo specifically says, we took critical race theory and we tried to turn it into something toxic. This is a quote. The goal was to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. Kimberly Crenshaw, many of you may know her name as the 
person who invented the term intersectionality said this is definitional theft. Turn the definition of something that actually is a thing into something completely different and potentially horrible. RuPaul acknowledges that that was his goal, that he has shared his analysis with state legislatures all over the country, the U.S. House of Representatives and Senators in the U.S. Senate. Uh, he, he's worked with the Heritage Foundation to produce legal language that is being adopted around the country, and that brings me to Ohio, I think. We've had 327 and 322 prohibit school districts uh, from teaching and promoting divisive concepts. 616, which is the one we're working on now, same idea, uh, prohibits all Ohio schools from teaching or providing training that promotes or endorses divisive or inherently racist concepts. In all of these bills, they also say none of this uh, violates the First Amendment. We respect the First Amendment. We want to go out of our way to say we don't want people to feel stereotyped. We don't. So there are a lot of good words in these bills. But it seems that the intent is actually to censor teachers and make them uh, afraid to teach the content that is so important uh, to so many of us. Um, in Ohio, the text of the Ohio bill, and I looked at this today, uh, the definition of divisive concepts includes all of the following, critical race theory, the whole body of intellectual thought, which is massive and vibrant and really important, intersectional theory. Well, that's my discipline. We're in the studies. That's, that's all we do is intersectional theory. Um, the 1619 Project, specifically, that specific curriculum named in a bill. Diversity, equity, and inclusion learning outcomes. Inherited racial guilt. Any other concept from the State Board of Education defines as divisive or inherently racist in according to the So, so this, they're calling anti-racist work racist. This is a strategy we've seen before. Of course, the bills are vague, the language big and broad just makes people paranoid. People, get, people are afraid to lose their jobs. People are censoring themselves in the presence of the bill, and that's what we mean by a chilling effect. It doesn't even have to go into effect to have the effect it needs to have. Why are we having a debate about bills that censure freedom of speech? Um, Last, sorry for being so long. Of all the years that I participated in this celebration, celebration of the right to read, this slate of, of bills around the country feels the most scary and serious. I think that the context of backlash against the white racial awakening after the murder of George Floyd and former President Trump's, you know, admiration of Putin, admiration of Hitler's generals support for the good people on both sides in Charlottesville, you know, the whole string of, of positions that he took that were racially inflammatory, not to mention his overt and blatant sexism, um, have left many of us, as, and again, I would say, especially majority um, defined people as threatened and scared. State legislatures' willingness to embrace these bills that obviously challenge the First Amendment despite their claims to the opposite make our democracy and all of our rights feel less secure than I felt in a lifetime. I'm willing to acknowledge that parts of this reflect my racial privilege, but as a lesbian who grew up in the era, era when there was no queer visibility at any point, anywhere, anywhere in the culture, I can tell you I have no interest in going back to that day. And in fact, it feels like much more than the ability to say gay is at stake. Thank you.